Hey, have you ever heard anybody say, you know now that you are a follower of Christ? All of us as believers in Christ, for every Christian, we are victorious and you are walking in victory. But have you ever thought, I'm not feeling what they're saying? I just don't know about this. I mean, I, I wish that I could walk in the victory that I heard the preacher preaching about. I wish that I could feel and sense the victory in my life, like the song that we just sang on Sunday morning, but I just don't feel it. Well, can I encourage you today with this midweek booster shot? Because number one, this is a walk of faith, not a walk of feeling, okay? So how we feel sometimes will, well, it'll kind of lie to us. And not only that, sometimes uh, we might be influenced by something else, somebody else in our life, our past, a sin, or maybe the devil is even trying to throw shade on what God says about us. Because the one thing is for sure, as we as believers begin to learn to walk in the victory that Christ has, it's awkward. It's weird. I mean, it is. It's just, it's something that we kind of have to learn to walk in that transformation. And for people, there's leaders in church, there's various people through the years that I've heard, it's like, well, they don't really have any compassion when it comes to that. They're just like, Wait, what's wrong with you? Get yourself up. Don't you know that you're victorious? Well, you know, my head is having a hard time wrapping itself around the fact of what you're saying. But as we grow in our relationship with God, we just figure out that that is actually true. But there's some things that you got to know. If you're going to walk in the victory that Christ has for you, the devil ain't going to be happy about it. So he's going to do all he can to cause doubt. He's going to throw shade on what God says. He's going to get in between you and God, try to, so that maybe he doesn't block out the light completely. He just questions everything, right? Uh, and so we find this story that you know very well, I'm sure, in the Old Testament uh, about a guy named David and a big giant named Goliath. I know you know the story, but... Maybe after today, you might look at it a little differently because of the way we're going to talk about this today. Let's look. If we look in 1 Samuel chapter 17, um, verse, I don't know, 3 through 11 or so, because you understand that they're set up here to do battle. Um, Saul, who was the king, and the Israelites on one side, and then you've got the Philistines on the other, and the giant and everything else. And so... They occupied one hill while Israel, Israel occupied another, and there was a valley in between them. So in verse 4, it says, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. All right, His height was six cubits in a span, which is basically nine and a half feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore a coat of scale armor, bronze weighing 5,000 shekels on his legs. He wore bronze greaves and, and javelin was slung on his back, his spear. I mean, you get it. I mean, he's a giant, and he's dressed... Uh, incredibly uh, intimidating, right? So Goliath in verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, to everyone, all right? Why do you come out and line up for battle, right? Am I not a Philistine and are not you, you the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Well, then the Philistines said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Okay, And this was just words that he was saying. Now, can I say, first of all, verse 4, kind of going back in that, Goliath was a champion. He was looking for a fight against someone that might become the champion. And most likely person to be that champion would be the king, King Saul. So, But verse 11 says that hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified, okay? So it could have just said that the Israelites were terrified, but it says Saul and all the Israelites were terrified. Because this is what I see when I look at the scripture. You know, you know when you're sitting in a room and a kid talks back to their mother and everyone looks at the mother, you know, like, oh boy, that kid is going to get it now, you know, you know, and, and that, that, oh, it's going to ha you go down. So see, when Goliath was talking smack, I'm going to imagine that all the Israelites were looking at Saul. Why is that? Well, because they would have fed off Saul. 
You know, I mean, the, the, if he would have been strong, they probably would have reacted in a stronger way. But since he was shaking in his boots, they were all shaking in their boots. So Saul was the king, and the king was technically the likely champion. But sometimes the most likely is the least likely. <laughs> it's crazy, because the least likely might not be the least likely in the eyes of God, and God can take the least likely and make them the most likely, except the world will never see that coming because they were never the one to be expected to be the most likely. Did you catch all that? <laughs> so in the story, the most likely was shaking in his boots, right? But don't be worried, right? Because the least likely was on his way over to pay a visit to the champion. But nobody knew it yet. You see, God is looking for a champion today. Are there any champions out there today? <laughs> is that you? And before you say, that could never be me, well, that's part of your problem right there. Because I used to say the same thing. And for me to sell myself short is to sell the God that resides in me through Christ short. And so I've learned that, you know what? I am, I can do these things. Not because I'm great, because of the one that lives in me. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, right? So, but nonetheless, so it's not the one that the world thinks will win. It's the one that God has equipped to win, okay? So you may not be the one that everybody thinks is going to be the one that comes out on top, but it doesn't matter what everybody thinks. It only matters who God has equipped to go out and to do this. You're going to catch the world off guard when they see what God is going to do through you because you are the least likely and God is good at making champions come from the least likely. So the first thing that we see in this uh, when it comes to dealing with the devil, with the enemy, is that the enemy, number one, as God speaks to you, as God proclaims who you are over him, as you get into the word of God, as you grow in your walk with uh, Jesus, the enemy is going to question everything, right? So you notice that Goliath asked the Israelites in verse 8, if you go back and look at that story, why y'all coming out here to fight? I mean, there's a question. It's like, you know, you see, there are many attributes we could probably name that are behind those words from Goliath. However, there's one I think is most important in relation to our own battles with the enemy, and it's called doubt. You see, a doubt is an age-old tactic used by the devil, the evil one, in our lives even to this day. Have you ever struggled with doubt? I mean, you know, I have. I bet you you have too. The reality is we all have this kind of natural tendency. It's our part of the sin nature, if you will, of doubt from time to time. And the devil knows that, and the, he's evil. He's a jerk, and he's the king of doubts. So in the case of Goliath, uh, can't you just see the Israelites' heads dropping after this question? You know, he's right. We are wasting our time. We can't defeat him. We can't fight against him. But do you want to hear something wild? See, I think Israelites would be completely accurate in their assumptions. They are right. They can't defeat Goliath on their own. <laughs> you see, however, there will soon be a warrior. Uh, he's making his way over, and they don't know it yet, who rolls up to the scene, doesn't try to fight the, this, this, his enemy with his own strength, this is something we, that we can't miss, I believe, because some of us have allowed discouragement and doubt to slip in because we have the wrong perspective on our battle. The Bible makes it clear. We were never meant to fight the enemy on our own. In fact, if we try to do it all on our own, I can guarantee you that we will fail, that we will be defeated. So David's biggest influence wasn't a weak army or a weak king, but his biggest influence was God, and God had been preparing David for this moment for a long time, all right? But nobody saw that. Everybody underestimated him, but God equipped him already to do this very thing. Now, we'll always lean toward doubt when we are listening to the enemy more than we are God. So David was confident. That's one thing's for sure. If you're listening to the devil, if you're listening to other people talk about what you can't do or what they can't be done or your past is bigger or reminding you of your sin and everything else, then you're no doubt you're going to be influenced by those people. And so doubt is going to reign supreme in your life. But as we listen to God more, as we grow closer in our relationship through the word, through prayer, 
uh, through connecting with other believers, then it builds this confidence in us. And David was confident. He didn't doubt, not because he was good enough, but because he knew that his God was great enough. You know, so interestingly enough, right after Goliath asked this question to the Israelite army, he makes a profound statement. He says, I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. You see, because not only the enemy will cause doubt, but the enemy will condemn you. But see, the Bible says in Romans that therefore there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But the enemy knows the word of God, and he knows if you don't know it and walk in that, that he's going to convince you that you are condemned. He will condemn you. Because in verse 8, of Goliath is seeking to elevate himself above the rest of the Israelite army. We just spoke about doubt. But here I want you to look at uh, about trust. Think about this. When we remove everything else, who do we trust? Who do we serve? Who do we look to? You see, it's clear how prominent uh, division is in our world. In fact, I would argue it is one of the most prominent tactics of the devil among God's people. He will do whatever it takes to associate you with anyone but God. Some have associated ourselves with our denomination affiliation, more so than our identity with Christ, that people would know that we are whatever denomination we are before they know that we are a believer and follower of Jesus. And just because I'm part of a denomination does not make me a believer or follower of Jesus. You know, it doesn't. Some are more inclined to look to a political leader, right, than God himself for our hope. And when we do, it only creates further division among everyone. So the difference between the Israelite army and David uh, is perspective on the situation. You see, in our own lives, what kind of perspective do we have when we receive questions? When we hear a voice of condemnation, do we automatically just believe that to be true? My wife has taught me this over the years. Not everything that comes out of everybody's mouth is the truth. Because I want to believe everybody. I want to have compassion on everybody. But I found out that not everything that everybody says is honest. That there are people that lie. There are people who manipulate. And I'm not trying to be mean or judgmental. But the thing is, that's just the way it is. So whose voice am I going to believe? If we claim to follow Jesus, that means we serve a risen Savior, one who is all-powerful. And it's important to remember this when we sense a false identity being thrown our way by the voice of condemnation. We know that's not from God. This dialogue between Goliath and the Israelite army comes to a temporary close in verse 11. But then the Bible says when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. So the final thing we must realize today is that the evil one is an overall tactic. I mean, he, he is great at striking fear. So not only is he good at casting doubt and condemning you, but he will strike fear in you. And I've read somewhere before, and it's been a while, that I think it was like 80-some or 90% of the things that we worry about and concern ourselves about and cause us anxiety are not even real and do not even happen in our lives. But we have fear that comes up in our mind. And then we start having all these struggles. And unfortunately, it cheats us out of so much. Now, I'm not trying to be mean. I struggle with the same things that you struggle with. But this should be an encouragement to all of us because we already talked about how the devil wants to distract people like you and me from God. He will do whatever it takes to make that happen. And one of the most prominent tactics is by using things like questions, doubts, and condemning words to strike fear in us. Fear will often try to keep us from stepping out in faith. Think about the story in Matthew 14 when Peter walks on water. The story is one of Peter taking an action. Uh, it's an action step of faith, doing something that he's not qualified for. He's not good enough for it. I mean, there's, it's crazy, right? Uh, and there are four crucial words spoken by Jesus, however, prior to Peter taking his step. He said, do not be afraid. Boy, I tell you, Peter seemed to have the confidence he needed because of the voice he chose to listen to and trust. And as long as he had continued listening to that voice and looking to Jesus, 
I don't know how far he would have walked on that water. But that's the question we must be confronted with today. Which voice are we listening to in order to trust? That decision is up to us. The struggle is real, no doubt. But if we are disciplined and we constantly go back to the word of God, we constantly put ourselves in a position that make prayer more than a means to just ask God for stuff, but prayer is a means to connect with God, then we will put ourselves in a position to be able to hear God better and know that when we are faced with those things that the devil sends our way, like doubt or like uh, uh, fear or condemnation or whatever it is, that we can say, I see you, devil. I, I see you trying to get in the way of God. And the devil don't come in, and we've got this mindset that this this pitchfork guy with, I mean, he's red and he's got horns and all this stuff. No, no, not at all. That's so insane. That's like the Looney Tune version of the devil. The devil is clever, you know. I mean, this was a an incredible being that God created that turned his back on God and and, and was able to convince a third of the angels in heaven. So it, it, I would consider that to be a very, uh, I don't know, influential, crafty, um, smart but dumb, you know. But nonetheless, that's who we battle. And the thing about it is he knows God's word better than we do. So he's not going to just show up with his pitchfork and say, I'm here to destroy your life. No, it's a very subtle thing. It looks good on the surface, right? I know that because I've experienced it myself. I've went down some slippery slopes that I thought that it was legitimately God. And then I found out that it wasn't. But you know, as we grow in our relationship with God, we will be more confident in the fact that we can see the devil right there at work where many others may not be able to see it. And some may even cast doubt on you because, well, you see it and they don't. But you got to stick to it. Because God has called you. So the word of God shows us consistently what God's voice actually sounds like. What God says. And that's why it's so important to spend time reading and studying it. And in fact, I've heard it said, we must soak and bathe in the word of God. That's really one of our most powerful sources when it comes to being able to distinguish which voice we need to listen to. See, I believe that God has put inside of you a David. And I believe that you can defeat that giant. But it doesn't matter what I think and it doesn't matter what I believe. Because the only thing that matters is who you listen to. And that is a choice that you make. That is a choice that I make. And I understand because I deal with the same struggles. But I do believe if we allow God to speak to us every day through his word. You say, well, pastor, I'm reading his word and I don't hear his voice. You know, you may be surprised how much you're hearing his voice. Because a lot of times we think God's voice should sound like something and be saying something specifically. But sometimes God's voice don't sound like what we think it sounds like, what we think it should sound like. And it doesn't speak the things that we think it should be, he should be saying. Instead, God is speaking things that God wants to say because it's not about what we think. It's not about our agenda. It's about God's. So as you allow God's word to speak into your life, you may be surprised how much God is speaking to you and you don't even realize that God is the one speaking. Give his word a chance and allow God to do a great work in your life because there is a David inside of you. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this booster shot. Thank you for this encouragement today. And I pray that we will every day work toward hearing your voice above every other voice that can come through in this world against us. There's so many things trying to get our attention, but God, I pray that we'll give your voice the attention over it all so that we can discern which way, what to do, and who we are in you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.